Hello, and welcome to the Westminster Confession of Faith Online. In today's lecture, we're going to be looking at the historical background to the Westminster Assembly. First, we'll begin by looking at the roots of the Assembly in the English Reformation, and then the surrounding political and ecclesiastical situation that led to the Assembly's call, specifically the English Civil War. From there, we'll be looking at the purpose and composition of the Assembly, who were these men, why were they there, and what was their immediate task, and then finally, what was the work of the Assembly? What did they do, and what pieces of scholarship did they produce? How can we understand this in kind of the full realm of English church history? The Westminster Assembly met between 1643 and 1652, although its main work was completed by 1649. It was called by an act of the English Parliament in order to advise the Parliament on religious matters during the English Civil War. We'll look at the background of that as we go. First meeting on July 1st, the Assembly would uh, come together to reform the liturgy and church government of the English Church, but would go beyond that to establish a new confession, a new form of government, and a new set of catechisms for the education of the Church. In order to understand this assembly, which is given to us, the Westminster Confession and more, we must understand the issues and challenges that led to this assembly, largely connected to how the English Reformation played out, the various 17th century ecclesiastical struggles, especially between the Puritans and who became the Laudian party, and the struggle for political power in England between the Parliament and the King. All of these things swirl around the assembly and place it very firmly in the historical context of 17th century England. We should not look at these documents completely ahistorical. They are part of a progression of the understanding of Christianity borne out through time. However, at the same time, these are not polemical documents per se. If you read these documents without knowing the history, you would have no idea that they were writing this in the midst of a massive civil war and civil upheaval. The divines were not primarily political actors, nor did they mean to be. They truly meant to be clergy setting forth the will of God from the scriptures as best as they could possibly understand it. So, what events ultimately led to this assembly? Let's begin with the coming of Protestantism to England itself. If you remember your Reformation church history, you'll know that Protestantism came to England with a dispute between Henry VIII and the papacy, specifically over his right to divorce his wife, Catherine of Aragon. Now, they'd been married for quite some time, and yet she had not produced a male heir, only one daughter named Mary. And Henry was quite concerned. You see, Henry's dynasty, the Tudors, were rather new to England. They'd only gained power in the time of Henry VIII's father, Henry VII, in the War of the Roses. And therefore, he was concerned that anything less than a, a legitimate male heir would lead to the downfall of his dynasty. Additionally, Catherine of Aragorn had been married to Henry's brother, Arthur, who had died before him. And so, with a combination of political issues and the religious issue that technically you were not supposed to marry your brother's widow, although he'd been given a dispensation by a previous pope. However, the pope was in his own issue. If you remember what's going on in the European continent at this period, Martin Luther has come forth as a major figure. There is dispute throughout the Holy Roman Empire and Switzerland over the Reformation faith. And actually, as Henry is attempting to gain this divorce from his wife, um, the Pope is currently being held captive by the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, who happens to be the nephew of Catherine of Aragorn. So there's a massive amount of political issues going on here, and some of the advisors around Hen Henry are saying, here's how we can get this done. We will abolish our connection to the papacy, we will declare the English church independent of all papal authority, and you will become head of the church. And in fact, this is what Henry does in 1534 with the Act of Supremacy. He establishes himself as the head of the English church and therefore begins to confiscate monastic lands and do some basic but very minor updates to theology. You see, Henry VIII himself was not a Protestant in any meaningful sense. What he desired was an English Catholic Church. And there were many underneath him that were happy to go along with that, hoping eventually to regain and rejoin the papacy. 
However, there were other parties, especially around his second wife, Anne Boleyn, who desired to see the Reformation truly come to England, to reform both the theology, the life, and the structure of the English church. Now, these different parties vied for supremacy under Henry, um, and in his attempt to marry various wives, if you'll remember, he has six in total, these parties kind of rose and fall in favor under Henry's reign. Ultimately, as he nears his death, the Protestant party is in ascendancy. This is especially the case because Jane Seymour, Henry's third wife, had born a male heir, Edward VI, and Jane Seymour's brother was deeply in favor of Protestantism. So at the end of Henry VIII's life, the Protestant party was ascendant and they had a new heir to the throne. And it's under Edward VI that the Reformation truly comes to England. When Edward VI came to the throne at the age of nine, he was seen as a new Josiah, a young boy king who would bring Reformation, who would bring religious unity, who would bring faithfulness to England. And there were many around him, Protestant uh, advisors such as his uncle and others, who would use this opportunity to really push forward the Reformation faith in England. Now, by this time, England had largely drifted away from any connection to Lutheranism in the Holy Roman Empire and had been more and more influenced by the Reformation faith coming out of Switzerland. This was especially the case through Edward's main advisor, uh, <clears throat> Thomas Cramner, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, he'd been made this by Henry VIII before him and had continually been pushing for an increased element of Reformed theology and faith. However, Henry was a little nervous about uh, Cramner at various periods, and it was only under Edward VI that he was able to have full reign. Now, Cranmer did this partially by creating a new liturgy for the Church of England. This is called the Book of Common Prayer, which is still used in Anglican services today, although it's been modified many times. Cranmer wrote the first edition of the Book of Common Prayer in 1549, and then a revised, more Protestant edition in 1552. Now, what this did was a unified liturgy and service for all of England, replacing the Mass of the Catholic Church, which was in Latin, with a native English liturgy that would move through set prayers, set scripture readings each time, responsive readings, etc. And by the law, this was the only liturgy that was allowed to be used. One of the elements of the English church is the combination of state power and church power. They were seen as one and the same, as the king is now the head of the church. And so Cranmer was able to move forward these ideas. Additionally, um, he would bring in support from the continent to solidify the Reformation faith in England. Specifically, he would call on the services of Martin Bucer and Peter Martyr Vermigli. Bucer was the reformer of Strasbourg, which at this time had uh, come under the power of the Catholic monarchy, so he was fleeing. And Peter Martyr Vermigli, originally an Italian theologian, but also uh, spent quite a bit of time in Switzerland, especially being influenced by the Zurich members, uh, Zwingli and later Bollinger. These two men were invited to England to take up chairs of divinity at Oxford and Cambridge, respectively, with Bootser going to Cambridge and Vermigli going to Oxford. Cramner would rely on these men to begin to train up a new reformed clergy and help him reform the church. Things were all going quite well under Edward VI. It was thought that through this activity, a fully reformed church would come about in England. However, while Edward was a very precocious young man, it was said that he knew four languages, that he studied theology deeply, and that this was not just a sideshow for him, he deeply cared about the reformation of the church, he was always a sickly young man. And he dies um, into his teens, 15 or 16. With this, the crown of England is going to pass to Ed, or Henry VIII's first daughter, Mary I. Now, Mary was the daughter of Catherine of Aragorn, and as you can imagine, since her mother was pushed aside in uh, favor of Protestantism, she was quite opposed to this. She was committed to Catholicism, and as she came to the throne, she reestablished it as the official religion of England. To solidify this, she married the Spanish king, 
Philip II, and there was an intentional effort to roll back all the Protestant measures put forward by Edward VI and Henry VIII. Because of this, many of the leading figures of Protestantism in the previous generation were arrested, tried, and ultimately martyred for their faith. This include Tom, included Thomas Cramner, who was arrested and ultimately did recant his Protestantism, only to re-recant on the eve of his death. As he was burned at the stake, it was said that he thrust his hand into the fire, saying that this foul beast will burn first, because it had signed his recantation. In addition to Cramner, several other very prominent Protestant and Reformed figures, such as Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer, both of whom had been bishops under Edward and were major proponents of the Reformation faith, were also martyred, uh, this time in Oxford. The Marian persecution, while not extremely widespread, less than 1,000 people were burnt at the stake of this period, did leave a lasting impression on the English church seeing Catholicism not merely as the old faith, but as the faith that would seek to oppress them, to destroy Englishness as a whole. Now, when Mary came to the throne, many Protestants would flee to the continent, thereby even further solidifying the connection between the English clergy and the continental reform tradition. Many of these figures would go to Zurich, and others would go to Geneva. In both these places, they were mentored by figures such as Heinrich Bollinger in Zurich and Calvin and Beza in Geneva. And these men would come back and, as the persecution of Mary was lifted, would have leading roles in shaping the identity of the English church in the next generation. Mary's reign was rather short, and she was quite unhappy in it. Her marriage was failing, she was never able to have an heir, and she was overwhelmed by the struggles going on around her. When she died as on the same evening as her Archbishop of Canterbury, Reginald Pohl, who had been her uh, implementer of persecution of the Protestants, her younger sister, Elizabeth I, came to the throne. Now, Elizabeth was the daughter of Henry VIII and his second wife, Anne Boleyn. Elizabeth would have a personal stake in Protestantism. If it was not the case, her mother's marriage to her father was illegitimate, and therefore she was illegitimate. However, not only did she have political reasons to hold to Protestantism, but she was committed herself. Elizabeth's own faith would shape the tenor and the structure of the English church. When she came to the throne in 1558, she slowly would work through Parliament to reestablish Protestantism in the following year. In 1559, she passed the Act of Uniformity, which unified all church worship under the Book of Common Prayer, now updated to the 1559 edition. In this, all churches throughout England would have to follow the set liturgy of this. In addition, she would organize a book of sermons to be the main model for preaching throughout England. And in fact, she would prefer if all ministers would merely read official sermons rather than producing their own. She would also approve the 39 articles as the doctrinal standard for the church. This is a modification of a document written by Thomas Cramner, uh, during the reign of Edward VI that was originally the 42 Articles. These articles are very clearly a Protestant document, affirming the sole authority of Scripture, reject, rejecting transubstantiation, holding to election, etc. These are not in some ways a middle place between the Catholic Church and the Protestant, as some later Anglicans will claim, but rather the 39 Articles place them between Wittenberg, or the Lutheran doctrine, and Geneva and the full Reformed faith. What is established under Elizabeth religiously, we often call the Elizabethan settlement. In this, she wants uniformity in the church, in worship, and in doctrine, but with a certain leeway. She does not want to push any farther. And so, one could summarize the nature of the Elizabethan settlement as a Reformed church, but not yet fully Reformed. It is reformed in doctrine in almost every way, in unity with the continental reform traditions of Geneva, Zurich, and beyond. But its liturgy and its polity are still in the form of the more uh, Catholic Church of the Middle Ages. Bishops are still around. You have a set liturgy with all elements 
uh, set forward, and there are elements that are not in line with a strict reading of Scripture, that are considered traditions that are acceptable for the church. This will be one of the main areas of dispute, not just in Elizabeth's reign, but moving forward. Can we have aspects in the liturgy that are not expressly declared in Scripture? Parties will develop that will say anything that is not expressly put forth in Scripture as an element of our worship should be set aside. And this is where tensions emerge during Elizabeth's reign. A party develops in the church who will come to be known as the early Puritans that are pushing back against most of this. They will reject a fixed liturgy in the Book of Common Prayer and uniformity, desiring rather a, a freer service that is not prescribed by the government. Additionally, they will question the continued use of vestments in the church, especially the surplus, as you can see here. Now, what was the issue with this? Many Puritan, early Puritan figures, rejected this entirely, seeing it as a non-biblical imposition that the state could not say. Their position would be, if the Bible does not expressly say we must do this, we shall not do it. The position of the establishment church in the Elizabethan settlement was, because this is not prohibited, the church can demand it, because it is not a violation of anything in Scripture. This struggle between what will become known as the regulative principle, that one cannot do anything that Scripture does not expressly allow, versus the normative principle, which would say, we can do anything in church that is not expressly forbidden in Scripture, will be one of the defining aspects of the struggle within the English church. We'll talk about this more when we get to that section of the confession. So, you have a growing number of people who are struggling with this fixed liturgy, who do not want to be bound to it, who want to go their own way and to adapt it as necessary. They're questioning the issues of vestments, but even more so, they're questioning the structure of bishops. In the Protestant churches on the continent, almost everyone had set aside any question, all, all of them rather, had set aside questions of bishops, and many were gravitating towards a Presbyterian and synodal system, especially in France, the Netherlands, and in the Swiss Confederation. And many of these people who'd been trained in Geneva, who'd been trained in Zurich, wanted to apply the same. They found no biblical warrant for the office of bishop. They saw this hierarchical nature of the church as leading to corruption. However, Elizabeth would have none of this, seeing the bishopric as at least a non-issue, and if not, a unifying element for the English church. Additionally, Elizabeth was quite suspicious of Puritan preaching, and what they called prophesying. Now, this wasn't what you would imagine if, as prophesying. This would be coming together weekly with other members of the church and clergy to read and interpret scripture together, to have what the Puritans called godly conversation. Elizabeth was worried about this. She wanted a control of the state over the preaching of the church. So she would uh, outlaw prophesying or these small group meetings to interpret scripture, and she would push very firmly for a de-emphasizing of independent sermons, preferring rather the sermons to be preached from the official book. Out of this time does come, as I mentioned, the early Puritans, who pushed on all of these issues. They desired to see a further reform of the liturgy, making it more free, not having as much prescribed elements in each part. They, Certain of them, and the more radical, wanted to see an end to the episcopacy and an implementation of Presbyterian government in line with the continental churches. This was not the unanimous position amongst the English Puritans at this time, but it was a leading party led primarily by the Cambridge theologian Thomas Cartwright. Uh, and Cartwright would be ultimately jailed at various points and even exiled for his position against the bishops and for Presbyterianism. Now, many of the Reformed churches on the continent, in advising these people, would say, yes, we don't think bishops are the best idea, but the it is not necessarily an issue of schism at this moment. Those ideas would change later on. Another area of struggle was the observation of the Sabbath, with many Puritans seeing this as uh, moving into a very worldly observation of the Sabbath rather than one that is honoring of the day. All these issues that are coming up in the 1560s, 1580s, etc., um, will continue to be so as we move into the assembly. The religious policy was looking like it might change as we enter into the early 17th century. Elizabeth has died, she did not ever marry, and so she does not have an heir, and the crown of England passes to James VI of Scotland. 
Through various aspects of genealogy, the King of Scotland was the next in line, and therefore James VI of Scotland becomes also James I of England. Now, these two crowns are held by the same man, but they are not united. The Scottish nation, the Scottish kingdom rather, um, is established on its own orders, has its own church, etc. Same with England. It is merely the same man who is king of both. There is no kind of unified government. Each is still quite distinct. The Puritans, who had largely lost some steam during the end of Elizabeth's reign, um, many of the Puritans who wanted Presbyterianism, for instance, had been exiled or removed from their positions of power. However, many who still desired reforms of the church thought they might have a chance with James. You see, James was raised in the Scottish Reformed Church, which had a mixture of Presbyterianism and bishops at the time. Uh, the Scots weren't particularly happy with that. We'll see that coming later on. And they thought that with him, they could get the church that they longed for, a church that was fully reformed in both structure, doctrine, and liturgy. This was their deep desire. Therefore, as James was moving south to ascend to the throne, coming to London, a number of ministers approached him of the Puritan party with a petition claiming that it had the signatures of a thousand people. It's for this reason it is called the millinery petition. Um, and therefore, he receives this and decides he will agree to at least consider their issues. Now, what did they ask? The millinery petition of 16... 03 calls for several things. They want a removal of the Book of Common Prayer as the required worship structure of the church, leaving it much more open to scriptural forms, and they want to see the continual reform of both the clergy and the doctrine of the church. They're concerned that many of those issues that had crept in during the Middle Ages, a rather corrupt clergy, one that is looking out largely for their own interest, had crept in. They wanted a clergy fully reformed, fully committed to the gospel in every way. One other aspect that was pushing back against this was their call for church discipline to be a purely ecclesial matter. This was a debate even on the Continental Church, with Zurich holding that excommunication and church discipline was a state function, while the church in Geneva uh, desiring it to be a purely ecclesial function. These early Puritans wanted to see church discipline purely in the church's hands, done by ministers and, many of them would hope, elders eventually. James heard this, but he was not very impressed. You see, while he was raised in the Reformed Church of Scotland, he did not particularly like it himself. And therefore, to address this, he called what is known as the Hampton Court Conference in 1604. And to the sadness of many Puritans, he upholds the Elizabethan statement in its entirety. Having a church that is still Reformed in doctrine, yet not Reformed in liturgy or in worship practices, or polity. There are still very much bishops. And in fact, James, just like Elizabeth, had a deep commitment to an episcopacy or rule by bishops. He even said at this period and others that without bishops, there is no king. What James saw was that as the structure of the church goes, so does the structure of the kingdom. A non-hierarchical church would lead people to expect a non-hierarchical state government. He saw these things as deeply connected. As the king derives his power ultimately from God, so the church must be structured also in a hierarchical manner. And he saw the church as a way to bring increased unity to the English kingdom. He doesn't he didn't blow off the Puritans entirely. He does give a couple minor issues to them. He allows for two minor changes of the Book of Common Prayer in the 1604 edition, adding the phrase for the remission of sins after confession to make sure it was clear that the pastor was not forgiving sins on his own power, as one might have it in the Roman Catholic Church, but by stating merely God's forgiveness as it's declared in Scripture. Additionally, he prohibited lay baptisms, which were a concern for both the establishment party and the Puritans at the time. One of his most far-reaching elements of the Hampton Court um, Conference was his authorization of a new translation of the Bible into English, which will eventually move us towards the authorized version, or the King James Version, in 1611. This was... Um, approved of by the Puritans. They wanted to see a translation of the Bible in the best way possible so that people could read it, could know it well. However, there was also an anti-Puritanness to this. 
One of the main Bibles at the time in England was the Geneva Bible that had been translated by those who had been influenced by the Genevan theology, which also had study notes that propelled a kind of very firm Genevan view of the church. James was not very pleased with this, um, especially because of its Presbyterian leanings. So when he created the translation committee, they were ordered to not allow Puritan influences to change any of the translations. Some of the examples of this are they intentionally retained the language of bishop to translate the term episkopoi, which in Greek generally means overseer, and continued to use the term church rather than congregation to refer for to specific individuations of the church, not wanting any element of Presbyterianism to sneak in. And with this authorized version, the other English translations were set aside as not approved by the church. Now, unless you get this idea that James was pushing against the Reformed theology of the church, it is really not the case. He was deeply concerned with religious policy in England, and he was committed, um, at least notionally, uh, to the Reformed version of the faith. We can see this in his authorization of a delegation to the Senate of Dort in 1618-19. to 19. He uh, wanted to make sure that the English church was still considered in the broader communion of the Reformed churches, and as the Senate of Dort meets in the Netherlands to discuss the question of Arminianism, an English delegation is sent and is in full support of Dort's uh, ruling against the Arminian tradition. However, he also wanted to make sure that the Puritans did not think too highly of him, and so in 1617 to, or 18, he issued the Book of Sports. This was to resolve issues in the church over what constituted proper Sabbath observance. The Puritans wanted to see a stricter Sabbath observance that was largely taken up by worship and praise, while others continuing on traditions of the medieval period, um, engaged in many recreations and leisure activities on the Sabbath. And this was a scandalous to many of the Puritans. James, who uh, wrote many books and was quite active in these debates, issued this book of sports that declared what was allowed and what was not on the Sabbath. He said yes to such things as archery, dancing, church ales, and maypoles. A church ale was when you would meet in the churchyard uh, in the afternoon after church and drink ale and socialize. But he did draw some lines. He said no to both bear baiting uh, and bull baiting, which are uh, spectator sports in which a bear or a bull is harried by dogs. And he prohibited lawn bowling. Um, seems like an odd one. But in this, he is stepping into very firmly that the government has the right to declare what is sinful and what is not on the Sabbath. And this was very troubling to Puritans, who saw these as very lax rulings for Sabbath observance, and were increasingly chafing at the control of the state over the church. What began in the early Presbyterianism in England of calling for further reform of the church according to liturgy and structure did soon develop in the early 17th century into a culture of its own. The Puritan party was not just a number of churchmen who were upset about the surplus and other things, but became a culture of those seeking to fully live their lives before God. Now, this is not to say that the non-Puritans, which by the way, Puritan was initially a term of abuse, uh, calling someone a Puritan was a way to say that they were over and above, and that they were, you know, not actually living rightly, but were just being Pharisees, might be the, the common calling of it today. However, they attempted to give their whole lives to God. And because of this, increasingly in the early 7th century, many of them became more and more disillusioned with the status quo of the church, seeing it as, as losing its heart commitment to God giving up on certain aspects of theology, not following the Bible closely enough and allowing human tradition to filter in. Some of these Puritans would leave England, going to the Netherlands first, and then even to the American colonies, so that they could follow the Bible purely on their own interpretations, while others increasingly um, stayed in England and developed their own culture. Now, what are some of the main characteristics of the Puritan way of life? We can't go into all of this today, but I just wanted to note a couple. First, they focused on a wholehearted devotion to God. 
Christianity for the Puritans was certainly not merely something that one went to a service on the Sabbath, but was meant to be an act of continual reflection, um, continual repentance, reading of scripture, engaging with one's sins. We see this throughout. And the entirety of human life, therefore, was meant to be done before God. One was to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and all aspects, and every aspect of our lives was to be brought into the will of God. This is often called precisionism. Uh, most clearly put, this is the claim that every area of life which is ordered by the Bible ought to be, that one should seek out wisdom in all areas of life and be precise because God is a Lord of order. Beyond this, we see the same thing of God of all of life coming to them, seeing God in the commonplace. This was partially through reflections on providence, but also seeing God in nature, seeing God's hand in his giving of daily bread, etc. One of the main themes for Puritans was that God was above all, all of our life, all of our heart, all of our activities. And this would include the sanctification of labor and work which you've often heard called the Protestant work ethic from um, Weber, is kind of derived from the Puritans' understanding that work is service to God, and that this is a way of unfolding God's creation. Additionally, because of this overarching sense of God's grandeur and God's power, they saw their own lives needing to be simple and sober, following the precepts of God fully, and living a life that did not give into material possession. It's for this reason, um, drawing from the continental reform tradition of iconoclasm and otherwise, that their church buildings were quite simple and plain. You see an image of it there. Whitewashed walls, exposed wood, and no crosses, no decorations. This was not because they hated such things. It was because they considered any distraction from God in the worship service to be unholy. And so the Puritans, focusing on all these aspects, would grow as a party as the beginning of the 1600s took off. And they would be opposed by the main line of their church, not because of their theology, but because of their call for continued reform and change of church structures. There were several parties I mentioned against the Puritans. One was more or less the status quo of the church, those who supported bishops, the Book of Common Prayer, and a slightly more lenient view of Christian living. This party um, was the main element of the church from the end of Elizabeth's reign through most of James's. One example of this was the work of John Whitgift, who was Archbishop of Canterbury in the latter period of Elizabeth's reign into the very beginning of James. He would oppose the Puritans and remove many of them from the pastorate and would often have them arrested. He was a thoroughly reformed figure in his theology, composing and promoting the Lambeth Articles, which were a clear declaration of reformed ecclesiology and, sorry, uh, reformed soteriology and doctrine more broadly. But he was deeply opposed to the schismatic element and the push for nonconformity amongst the Puritans. However, as we move deeper into the 1620s and beyond, another group begins to emerge. Now, there is no good name for this group. Eventually, it will come to be called the Laudians after William Laud, who is Archbishop under Charles I. However, before that, it can also be called the Arminian Party, the Early Anglican Party, or some the Avant-Garde Conformist Party, as in conformist here being conforming to the Book of Common Prayer in all things and according a uh, conforming to the structures of the church. It comes from a later distinction after uh, in English history between conformist and non-conformist churches. However, none of these labels quite apply early on. What we're seeing in this is those who are supporting the kind of compromised position of the English church as good and right, arguing that it is good to have Reformed theology, and it is good to continue to have bishops and church structures and the organization of the church from the top down. Some of the early figures in this movement are people such as Richard Hooker, who is fully reformed in his soteriology, and yet argues quite strenuously for bishops, argues quite strenuously that where the scriptures are unclear, the church has every right to declare a law upon it. And so Hooker would be a foundation of this new movement. Now, just a side note, later on in church history, especially in the 19th century with the emergence of the Anglo-Catholic movement, 
uh, influenced by John Henry Newman and others, will look at these figures as the actual origin and nature of Anglicanism, as a via media or a middle way between Protestantism and Catholicism. Now, most historians now argue that that is a misreading, especially of Hooker, uh, but maybe Laud has a little bit of a point here. This party slowly grows in the church. It is very much an establishment party supporting bishops and conformity to the Book of Common Prayer. Especially in the end of James I's reign, this party takes on greater and greater significance. And it's in this period that they begin to move away more and more from Protestant or Reformed Orthodoxy. And this can be seen in the work of Lancelot Andrews, the man on the bottom left there. He becomes the tutor to James the uh, sorry, he becomes the tutor to Charles the First. And by this, Charles is influenced by this very high church, increasingly Arminian form of theology. And this is going to ultimately lead to open conflict between Charles, the Laudians, and the Puritans. Charles I comes to the throne in 1625, and like his father, he is a very firm believer in the divine right of kings. He believes that he is above the law and that his reign derives directly from God. And because of this, he would often come into conflict with the other political source of power in England, the Parliament. And this continued to cause problems throughout his reign. He additionally um, made many people quite suspicious, Puritans and non-Puritans alike, with his marriage to Henrietta Maria, who was a French Catholic. And she was given permission to continue to see Mass, to, to have Mass said in her residency, and to have private priests. Now, remember what I said about Catholicism after Mary, that it was not seen as merely a different religion, but it was seen as a threat to the very English way of life and Protestantism. It was not only the persecutions under Mary that caused this issue, but the attempted invasion by the Spanish in the uh, event of the Spanish Armada in 1588, and such events as the Gunpowder Plot in 1605, in which Catholic terrorists attempted to blow up Parliament and the King. And so, Englishmen did not see Catholicism merely as a mistaken religion. They saw it as a national security threat in many ways. And by the King marrying a Catholic and toying with Catholicism themselves, many outside the Puritan party proper began to be quite concerned about another reintroduction of Catholicism into England. Because of these continual conflicts, and this would extend to many economic matters as well, Charles would set aside calling Parliament for quite some time. He resented Parliament's uh, in interference in political and religious matters, and therefore from 1629 until 1640, he refused to call them. This is generally called the period of personal rule. Now, there's a unique element to the English construction um, of government at this time, such that the king was not allowed to levy taxes without the approval of Parliament. And so, Charles I was having to run his government on his own personal holdings. He would get some workarounds by levying privileges and taxes that technically did not have to have the approval of Parliament, such as the ship tax, which he could levy on all, nation, uh, all cities on the coast, which he pushed to all cities in the entire kingdom. And so he was moving onward. At this time, during the personal rule, he would further push a very high church policy that was very top-down, that was removing all Puritans from positions of power. He would continually appoint um, very high church bishops to various sees, and this comes to a head with the appointment of William Laud as Archbishop of Canterbury. The appointment of William Laud as Archbishop really showed the hand of Charles I. He had continually been supporting this Laudian or Arminian party throughout his early reign. As I mentioned, he was actually tutored by a main member of this early on, Lancelot Andrews. And he tips his hand by appointing Laud first Bishop of London. Uh, while in London, Laud really clamps down on any Puritanism in his, uh, his diocese, fining and removing people for not following the Book of Common Prayer and even at one point banning preaching on predestination as divisive. He would later then become the Archbishop of Canterbury, and he was pursuing what was known as a policy of thorough. He wanted to be a thorough reform of the church, removing 
Puritan overreach, removing any element that would push back against bishops, removing anything that would challenge the centralized authority of the church. Additionally, because the Puritans were deeply Calvinist in their soteriology, he saw Calvinism itself as a challenge to the English church, and therefore would embrace a much more Arminian position on various things. In this, we do begin to see a very different understanding of what the English church was supposed to be. He wanted, and so did his party, to have the focus on the sacraments rather than preaching, seeing um, the sacraments and the call of people to abide in the church the main element here. This caused increasing conflict with the Puritans. Additionally, he upped the ceremonial worship of the church, reverting some of it back to the time of Henry VIII. That was not fully Protestantized. For instance, he would reintroduce a rail in communion that one would need to kneel at. Uh, this was a debate way back in the period of Edward VI, with many arguing that a communion rail and kneeling indicated a support for transubstantiation. And Laud knew this and intentionally introduced it back in. He also began to call um, the table's altars and adorn them with new elements. This pushed back very hard against Puritan impulses to respect scripture alone in matters of worship, to emphasize preaching, and to keep a very simple and sober service. Bob was against all of this, wanting to see a much more robust service with a centrality on the clergy. Some of these other major themes of the Laudian party that were pushed increasingly in Charles's reign were the promotion of ceremonial worship, uh, the increase in use of vestments, the increase in the use of incense, uh, the return of such things as crucifixes to the, the church services, etc. He actively promoted sacraments over preaching. We saw that was a debate all the way back in Elizabeth's time. How much was the individual minister to give leeway to preach? versus how much was kind of dictated from the top down. Lada was very much a man in support of top down instruction here. And he goes another step further than kind of more establishment Church of England figures in that he begins to argue for a very high view of clerical office and episcopacy. Many before him such as Richard Hooker, would argue that episcopacy, or the rule by bishops, is allowed by scripture and is a good and prudent way to structure a church. As we get to Laud, he begins to push much more firmly, arguing that this position is jure divino. By the law of God, bishops are to be there. Bishops are God-mandated, and he begins to emphasize the succession of bishops from ancient times, much like the Roman Catholic Church. And so bishops were not a first among equals, as has been discussed in earlier positions, but they truly are a step above and therefore have greater authority over the church, not merely by dint of structure, but by dint of ordination. It's also in this period that the term priest begins to reemerge in the English church. Now, Protestants generally call their um, clergy pastors or ministers, because there's a focus on the pastoral care or on the preaching of the word. The reintroduction of the term priest, which had been largely absent since the time of Edward VI, with the one exception of the Marian reign, re-emphasizes an idea of mediation by the clergy, such that they are mediating between the people and God. All of these things were increasingly worrying to the Puritans, and many others began to share their concerns, especially as Laud begins to undermine Protestant Orthodox teachings on predestination, grace, and assurance by embracing Arminianism. Now, one should be clear here, um, Arminianism technically at this period was a Dutch movement, but the same ideas which have prede uh, predecessors in medieval theology were native to England in many ways. This position argues that God does not choose who will be saved, but gives an opportunity to all to choose by their own free will whether or not to believe God. And therefore the church in this, this is kind of Laud's idea, is essential to continually moving people towards salvation by giving them grace through the sacraments and uh, kind of having the power to, to move them in line with the rest of society. This also calls into question Christian assurance. One salvation can be lost in this schema. 
So this emphasis on a much more Arminian theology, which is deeply out of step with the entirety of the English church's theology up to this point, is going to eventually bubble over into conflict. So as we stand here in the kind of the edge of the 1640, we see that Charles I has exercised great power over the political elements of society. He has refused to call parliament. Laud has been keeping down Puritans. He's been challenging Protestant orthodoxy, or Reformed orthodoxy, rather, throughout England. And this is going to come to a head. And this occurs because Charles and Laud overstep their bounds. The personal rule is going to not be sustainable as Charles needs to pay for a massive war. And this comes as Laud and Charles attempt to impose a Book of Common Prayer on the Church of Scotland in 1637. This is what is called as Laud's Prayer Book. Now, recall, Charles I is both King of Scotland and King of England. They have different orders, different structures of liturgy, of polity, of government, etc. Charles really wants to see a uniformed religion and a uniformed polity throughout his nation, in hopes, maybe, of uniting the crowns one day. And therefore, Laud, who favors episcopacy and favors uniformity in worship, puts together a prayer book that is going to be imposed on the Church of Scotland. Now, the Church of Scotland in this time is, has a rather complicated polity. It has formed a rudimentary Presbyterianism with church sessions and presbyteries and a general assembly that can meet occasionally, although it is often subject to the laws of the political realm. However, at the same time, there still exist bishops, and their position in the church is a bit unclear. Some want to see them as a hierarchical position, as they are in England. Some are content to see them as the moderator of a presbytery. There are pushes to make sure that they're actually ministering in a church. But at this time, the Presbyterian form of government is yet to come fully into play in Scotland, with bishops still around. And so, what Charles wants to do is push this further to a more Anglican style, a more hierarchical, Episcopal style of governance. However, this goes very wrong. One of the main impulses of most of the Reformed tradition is a rejection of the imposition by centralized authority of worship elements. You see this um, especially in places like Geneva, the Netherlands, etc. They generally like to see a bit of a separation between the power of the magistrate and the power of the church. Now, this is not universal. The Zurich position and the Erastian position that we'll talk about more in a second go against this. But Scotland was very much uh, on the side of a separation of ecclesial and political authority. So as this English archbishop tries to impose a common book of prayer on the Scottish people, this is going to cause problems. The new prayer book was unveiled at St. Giles in Edinburgh, and this caused a riot, purportedly started by a woman named Jenny Geddes, who took her stool and threw it at the minister. Now, at the time, there were no pews, and so if you wanted to sit in church, you had to bring your own stool. It is likely the case that this story is a bit apocryphal, or it was premeditated, because out of this comes a riot, and this will bubble over, ultimately, into war. Over the next several years, um, leading up to 1639, we will see the Scots mobilize, and they will ultimately fight what is known as the First Bishops' War against Charles I. This group of Scots come to be known as the Covenanters. As they rose up, they took an oath that is a bit difficult to understand in this period. They take an oath to support Presbyterianism as the official religion of Scotland, that's pretty clear, but also loyalty to the king. This is a commitment of the Scottish people together to be loyal to the king by fighting the king in order to establish Presbyterianism. This is going to come in later. A kind of standard trope in this period and throughout the Middle Ages as well is it was almost never the king's fault. It was the king's poor advisors. It was the king's uh, poor um, underlings who were really the problem. In this case, Laud being the problem. So the Scottish Covenanters, which were not the entirety of Scotland, but it does kind of eventually get most of the nobility and many of uh, the common people in the lowlands especially, they covenant together to defend Presbyterianism and to kind of reorder their society 
under proper loyalty to the king and their idea. The king under the law will eventually become the main element. This national covenant is signed in February of 1638. And this bond between them will be very powerful. They do defeat armies of Charles in both 1639 and 1640. And all of Scotland will ultimately be under the political control of the Covenanters by 1640. Now, this is going to cause some problems for Charles, as one might imagine. Meanwhile, back in England, Laud is trying to centralize authority there as well and continue to push out any of those who would seek to reform the church's structure, Puritans and otherwise. And he issues a new oath. This oath was needed to be taken by all clergy or all, and all members of uh, kind of the official church. And if they did not take it, they would be removed from their positions. This is what came to be known as the etc. oath. This is the most pertinent part, saying that, nor will I ever give my consent to alter the government of this church by archbishops, bishops, deans, and archdeacons, etc., as it now, as it stands now established, and as by right it ought to stand. This is going well beyond the acceptance of the bishopric as a prudent move that is allowable by scripture, which was uh, what was tenable to many within the church. This is saying that the Church of England is inviolable, that it ought to stand this way, that this is scriptural. But notice what you're agreeing to here. You're agreeing to archbishops and bishops, deans, archdeacons, etc. There is an elasticity here. Whatever element of the church that there is, whatever ceremonies are taking place, whatever activity is being done, this oath requires that you not change them. This caused many uh, to refuse to take this oath, and Law was in the process of trying to get them removed from office. So Law is centralizing control, but at the same time, Scotland is rebelling, and Charles needs money. He needs to raise a new army to go fight the Scots and put down the rebellion, and therefore he is forced to call a parliament. This occurs in 1640, after one attempt, known as the Short Parliament earlier that year, which uh, Charles almost immediately uh, disbands because it's making demands upon him, he is forced to call what comes to be known as the Long Parliament that will serve for uh, a number of years, up to about 1649, and will not officially be dissolved until 1660. He does this so that they will raise taxes, so that he can raise an army to defeat the Scottish Covenanters. But the Long Parliament, feeling much abused, which is largely made up of Puritans and others, are going to make demands. They make various demands to kind of curtail Charles I's power, giving themselves control over the army, for instance, removing his right to get around their taxing power, stating that he must call Parliament every three years, and many others. The Long Parliament continues to make concessions on Charles in both political and religious matters. And because he's rather weak, lacking broad support, and desperately needing funds to raise a military, he has no real choice but to go along for some time. However, as the pressures continue to mount, and the Long Parliament, and especially the citizenry of London, push for more and more reforms, Charles has had enough. At one point, he breaks into the Parliament, well, he, he enters into the Parliament's chamber and demands the arrest of five of its members. Now, this was illegal for the king to enter the Parliament's chamber. These men had already fled, and uh, he does not get his way. But this violation of parliamentary rights ultimately leads to rioting in London, and Charles ultimately flees. This conflict over who will have ultimate political control in England, the monarch or the parliament, will ultimately lead to the English Civil War, which is actually a series of wars over the next many years. We won't get into too much detail on this, uh, but it's this context that ultimately leads to the assembly. Now, like I said, the English Civil War or Civil Wars, sometimes also called the Wars of the Three Kingdoms, was a very complex affair with multi multiple sides fighting uh, and switching sides over and over. You have the forces of Parliament, which are largely uh, Puritan at the beginning. You have the Royalists who support the King. The Scots are their own force, uh, the Covenanters especially. The Irish also get involved, as in this period there is an Irish rebellion. And these sides switch every once in a while, and there are various tides and movements in the war. 
The English Civil War is often broken up into a set of three wars. The first English Civil War being between 1642 with the fleeing of Charles from England to Oxford and raising up his banner until he is ultimately captured in 1646. And this first phase of the war has the parliamentary forces allied with the Scottish Covenanters against the Royalists led by Charles I. And this first English Civil War is the main context for the Westminster Assembly and what goes on here. When the Long Parliament was called, it did seek to reform the religious as well as the political life of England. And to do this, it was very committed against the hierarchical um, church mode. Eventually, Laud would actually be arrested during the Long Parliament before the beginning of the Civil War. One of the key questions was what to do about this lingering issue of liturgy and worship. It had been bubbling in the English church all the way back to the time of Elizabeth, um, and more and more people were becoming uncomfortable with the ceremonial worship, with acts that did not seem to be warranted or grounded in Scripture. This was especially case, the case in London that had a large Puritan majority by this point. As the Parliament was trying to assess what to do, they were getting advice and petitions from various members of London. And one of those was what is known as the Root and Branch Petition that says, that the government of archbishops and lord bishops, deans and archdeans, etc., with all its dependencies root and branch may be abolished, and all laws in their behalf made void, and the government, according to God's word, may be rightly placed among us. This was given to the Long Parliament in December of 1640. Now, obviously, at this period, while many in the assembly might have wanted this, this was not enacted. But the, this idea of root and branch reform, was gaining more and more traction throughout the people, especially in London and beyond. This idea of removing the hierarchy, removing a sense of uh, tradition-based structures of the church, and bringing, as it says here, God, uh, government according to God's word rightly placed among us. Eventually, although this root and branch petition was not taken up in 1640, after the beginning of hostilities between the king and Parliament, the Episcopacy, Episcopacy was officially suspended in September of 1642. But with the suspension of the Episcopacy, new questions emerged. How was the English Church going to be organized? How was it going to bring together um, the religion of the nation? At this time in Europe, all nations had pretty much a single unified church structure. There were occasionally, by um, treaty, observed minorities who were allowed to exist, but were very much outside the official church, such as the Huguenot in France or the toleration of Lutherans in parts of the Holy Roman Empire. But this is not what England had ever had. They had always had a unified religious policy that was approved by the king. What was going to come now? The parliament, the um, official political structure of England, was now at war with the monarch. And the established element of order, the bishops, had been removed. How would a new structure emerge? It's out of this context that we see the calling of the Westminster Assembly. After abolishing the Episcopate, Parliament called for an assembly to advise it in all religious matters, made up of prominent theologians and advisors throughout England. This matter ultimately came to a head in the summer of 1643, and they would meet in Westminster Abbey outside of London, quite nearby to Parliament. There was a lot of correspondence between them, and they were quite nearby. The first meeting of this assembly took place on July 1st at a joint session attended by many of the members of Parliament as well. And the assembly gave <clears throat> was given a very clear task to begin with to reform the liturgy and government of the English church in accordance with scripture, and to vindicate and clear the church, those were the words they used, uh, from doc uh, the church's doctrine from, quote, false aspersions and interpret interpretations, as well as misconstructions. Now, what's this all mean? Basically, that desire of Puritans from way back to see a reform of liturgy and government was finally coming to fruition. But the original assembly did not have any intentions of adjusting the doctrine of the church. It was to be vindicated from false aspersions. Now, what does this mean? To accomplish this, they will begin by 
revising the 39 articles, the doctrinal basis that was passed back in the time of Elizabeth. Not to change it materially, but to clarify it such that it could not be read in an Arminian fashion. Many during the time of Laud would make arguments that would utilize ambiguities in the statements or uh, unsaid things to really emphasize this is not a reformed document. As some would even come to argue in the 19th century along these same lines, the 39 articles could be read in line with the Council of Trent, the Declaration of Post-Reformation Catholicism, which was certainly not the intention of Thomas Cramer, who wrote the original draft, or the Elizabethan divines who approved the final edition. And so, the Parliament called them, we want you to revise the liturgy, revise the church government, and revise the 39 articles in order to close off any attempts to misrepresent them in any way. The establishing mandate of the assembly rejected the current government of the church, as it says, quote, by archbishops, bishops, and their chancellors, commissioners, deans, deans and chapters, archdeacons, and other ecclesiastical offices, depending upon the hierarchy, is evil and justly offensive and burdensome to the kingdom a great impediment to reformation and growth of religion, and very prejudicial to the state and government of the kingdom, as quoted in Lethem. This call is saying those elements of the church are not merely a matter of prudence. They are, in fact, evil. They are antithetical to the proper running of religion and reformation in the church. So they must be set aside. You can see here echoes of both the etc. oath and the root and branch petition. All these things need to be reformed. And so to do this, we're going to see the Westminster Assembly begin its work in the revision of the 39 Articles. Now, who made up this assembly? Initially, Parliament appointed roughly 120 divines or theologians to sit on the committee. There's a bit of dispute in the literature whether it was 119, 120, or 121. Uh, and this is the initial call. Others would be added later. And many who were initially called did not come, especially those who were, who were supportive of the king in the Civil War, most uh, prominently amongst them uh, Bishop Usher. They were called not to sit alone, um, but were also connected to members of parliament. Where did these men come from? Two were to be called from each county in England, two from the Channel Islands, one from each Welsh county, and two each from Oxford and Cambridge, and four from London. Now, it didn't mean that these members were actually from these areas. They were voted in largely by the Parliament and local um, notables from these regions. And they were called to come together to meet at Westminster Abbey to advise Parliament. In order to uh, participate with them, 20 members of the House of Commons were chosen to sit amongst them, as well as 10 members of the House of Lords. These members, uh, with um, a few notable exceptions, um, one real notable exception, didn't really participate much in the deba debate. They were there largely to be Parliament's eyes and ears in the committee and to tell them to hurry up from time to time. While the whole of the assembly was 120 clergymen, its average attendance was somewhere around the low 60s for the plenary sessions, with uh, men traveling back and forth to their churches and having to be gone for various reasons. The assembly initially will meet in what is known as the Henry VII Chapel in Westminster Abbey, but quite quickly in October of 1643, we'll move to their established room, the Jerusalem Chamber, because it was warmer, and you see a etching of the Jerusalem chamber there. The assembly brought together some of the leading Puritan and moderate pastors and theologians of the day. And in this, they were not restricting it to Puritans alone. You see, as the assembly comes together, several parties emerge. Now, Van Dixhorn, um, one of the leading authorities on the Westminster Confession today has argued, and he is correct, that there was an overemphasis in previous scholarship of the ecclesiological divides at the assembly. The early debates at the assembly do deal primarily with church government, whether it should be of bishops, presbyteries, or of congregational reforms. 
these parties do emerge there and they do have deep convictions. However, these are not the only issues. As debate moves on to talk about the confession and the catechisms, while you can see elements of these div uh, divisions, they are not decisive in those later elements. But we should still note some of the major differences of political um, church polity and in some ways political stripes in the assembly. These ecclesiastical parties often fall in four. You have moderate Episcopalians, those who, while thinking laud went too far, that bishops are an approved way of governing the church, and we should modify the current system rather than removing it entirely. Uh, there were not many of these moderate Episcopalians, some were um, willing to engage it, but many who held this position never took up their seat in the assembly because they had sided with the king. At the beginning, the major party was the Presbyterians, wanting to bring the Church of England in line with something like the Church of Scotland after the Covenanters had removed bishops and established a purely Presbyterian form of government, with church sessions, regional presbyteries, and um, an oversight by a governing body. This was the majority of uh, the kind of prominent members of the assembly. However, in addition to Presbyterians, there did develop an independence party. This idea of independency, or what we come to know as congregationalism, argues that each individual church is a self-contained unit of ecclesiology, having all rights to its own governance, without any need of further oversight by a higher ecclesial body or the state. This idea of independency generally is thought to have begun in uh, parts of the Netherlands and the New World, especially as contact was made with older Anabaptist traditions. And you do get a number of thoroughly reformed, yet Congregationalist ministers in the assembly. We'll talk about some of those later on. Um, they will be weak in the beginning, but as time goes on, out with issues outside the assembly, the independents will gain much power. A final group that is a little more amorphous is the Erastian Party. Erastianism is named after a uh, continental theologian in Heidelberg named Erastus, which argues that the church should be under the state in all things. So the state should be above the church, and the church should be beholden to the state for all matters of discipline and theology. This is not all that unlike what you saw in Laud, but they wanted it to be much more thoroughly reformed. Uh, this was very questionable to many of the other parties. Uh, some moderate Episcopalians could be okay with Erastianism. Many Presbyterians were quite uncomfortable with it, and independents obviously were quite opposed to it. Now, Erastianism can come in various ways. Recall that the assembly was called by Parliament. It was very much Parliament's assembly, not an independent element of the church. And so there is a sense where the Westminster Assembly is very much an Erastian, uh, an Erastian assembly itself. However, that's not all there is to it. Erastianism is a further position arguing that all church discipline, all church doctrine, all church appointments, for instance, should be made by the state rather having than having an external uh, independent church hierarchy. And that was not always the case for every member of the assembly. So these men came together in order to advise on reforming the structure and worship of the church and to give a careful reworking of the 39 Articles. I do want to briefly speak on a couple of the members. We often talk about the Westminster Divines or the Theologian without knowing many of their names. Now, the purpose isn't to give praise to any of these figures individually, but to know that there were actual living, breathing theologians at work here. One of the most prominent for the Assembly, and one of the oldest, was William Twiss, who was appointed the prolocutor of the Assembly, the kind of moderator and leader. He was a renowned theologian, uh, rector of Newbury, and he was especially well known for his defense of predestination in a superlapsarian form. He was a very well known scholastic theologian and philosopher, and would be a kind of uh, figurehead as the, the most respectable of the assembly members. He was rather old when he was appointed, at 69 years old, and he would actually die during the assembly. Another major figure who was extremely prominent throughout most of the debates was Thomas Gattaker, who was kind of a contrarian, often had minority positions throughout the period, but was widely, widely respected. Uh, Philip Schaff, the, the great 19th century church historian, says this, He was a devourer of books and equally esteemed for learning, piety, and sound doctrine. 
Gadiker would be a continual push to make the assembly think through its biblical warrant, and he was a little skeptical of developments in Reformed theology in the 17th century. We'll see him discussed quite often in the Lethem text. Another significant figure who's often forgotten, this man didn't write a ton, but he was a major um, figure in this period, Cornelius Burgess, who was elected the deputy prolocutor and uh, called the assessor. And because of the illness of William Twiss and the other deputy would end up being the pro tem prolocutor for much of the major parts of the assembly. Cornelius Burgess would have a hand in writing almost all the documents that the assembly put out, and he would be the chairman of the first standing committee, which was the most prestigious of the committees in the assembly. Um, his guiding hand would really shape and mold the entirety of the assembly. Another major figure is Thomas Godwin, a uh, quite interesting figure. He is generally considered the uh, one of the patriarchs of English independency. He was a Congregationalist, but was also a renowned uh, pastoral theologian and scholastic theologian at the same time. He had pastored church in exile in Holland and independent churches in London, having lost his uh, position several times. During this period, he would ultimately become the president of Magdalen College in Oxford, and he would serve there until 1660. These are just a couple examples. There's many other that can be mentioned, such as Jeremy Burroughs or uh, Lazarus Seaman. These are men who really studied the scriptures. They knew it extremely well. They had studied it their entire lives. This was a mix of pastors, academics, all of whom knew the Bible backwards and forwards. And they labored diligently in order to see this reform of the church come to fruition. We can see an appraise of this assemblage of men from Richard Baxter, a contemporary uh, Puritan who was not uh, actually invited to the Westminster Assembly, but he thought for that reason he could judge quite well of their character. He says this, the divines there congregated were the men of eminent learning and godliness and ministerial ability and fidelity. And being not worthy to be one of them myself, I may the more freely speak that truth, which I know even in the face of malice and envy, that as far as I am able to judge by the information of all history of that kind, and by any other evidence left us, the Christian world, since the days of the apostles, had never ascended of more excellent divines, taking one thing with another, than this senate and the senate of Dort were. Now what he's saying here, and it's probably a little hyperbolic, as looking at the assembly of the Westminster divines as a whole, he sees a model of godliness, of commitment to scripture, and to truth. And he compares it very clearly to the Senate of Dort, which was an international reform meeting in the Netherlands earlier in that century. Both of these, the Westminster Assembly and the Senate of Dort, should be seen as the great councils of the Reformed tradition that were not just a confession written by one person or a small committee, but a deeply engaged commitment with the theology and scripture. The Senate of Dort does that for soteriology, and Westminster does that for the entirety of the faith. Now, we mentioned that the initial purpose of the assembly was a revision of liturgy and church government and taking up the 39 articles to make them clearer. However, this would all change with an alliance with the Scots. And this is called the Solemn League and Covenant, which was signed between Scottish Parliament and the English Parliament in 1643. Uh, in September, so only a couple months after the assembly had begun to meet. This was a commitment by the Covenanters and the parliamentary forces against the king. And because of this, the Scots wanted to maintain their Presbyterianism. Recall, the Scots had this hybrid model with the First Bishop's War. They removed the bishops and instituted a purely Presbyterian government. And by their national covenant, they were committed to keeping it. They thought if England was not Presbyterian, there would always be the chance that outside forces would attempt to overturn their Presbyterian form of government. So in agreeing to this alliance, they demanded that the English and the Scottish Church come into conformity. And this is what this says, that the nearest conjunction and uniformity in religion, confession of faith, form of government, directory for worship and catechizing be made between the English and Scottish churches. The Solemn League and Covenant was a binding treaty, and it would change the composition as well as the mission 
of the assembly, as the assembly was tasked by parliament to make this so. One of the ways this was done was the sending of the Scottish commissioners. The, a Scottish delegation was sent, made up of four major theologians and a collection of laymen, some were lay elders, some were lords, to uh, parley with Parliament on these issues, but also to advise the assembly. They arrived in London between September and November of 1643. The four main councillors were Samuel Rutherford, Robert Bailey, George Gillespie, and Alexander Henderson. Each of these men was quite renowned in Scotland, and each would play their own unique role in the assembly. Henderson, for instance, was the author of the Solemn League and Covenant. He was uh, quite active in pushing for this, although he did die during the assembly. Robert Bailey was quite active in committees at the assembly, and also left us behind his letters and journals, which are one of the uh, indispensable sources for the assembly itself. Both Rutherford and Gillespie would be some of the major speakers at the assembly, giving advice on various topics and debating them. All of these members were, um, all of these delegates rather, were allowed to enter into the assembly, but they chose not to. They held a non-voting role, seeing as they were worried that this might challenge their ability to advocate for the Scottish position. However, they were allowed to join committees and to speak to the question on the floor of the assembly. In fact, the Scottish commissioners were sat at the front um, next to the prolocutor. And so it was very clear that the Scots were a major element here. Now, uh, Letham and others have mentioned that in previous histories, the Scottish commis commissioners are given too much credit, as if they single-handedly reshaped the assembly. This is not the case. Uh, that misunderstanding is largely because most histories of the confession were written by Scotsmen, but very much the Westminster Assembly was an English affair, but the Scots were influential on pushing for certain things. They would ally very much with the Presbyterians on certain issues. They would lie very much against uh, the Erastians, so sometimes would uh, be in line with the independents, but their ideas and their thoughts would be very influential. Samuel Rutherford was probably the most uh, important of them, uh, being a leading theologian of the time, and later the author of a famous text, Lex Rex, or The Law is King, arguing against the idea of uh, divine right kingship. George Gillespie was one of the youngest of the members of the assembly in only 31, and would uh, be renowned for his ability to speak to the questions on the floor. So we've got the assembly set up. We have these 120 people called. Many will come together. We have the Scottish commissioners coming in, and their mission has changed now. In the fall of 1643, they are now called to reform the liturgy, church government, and the theology and catechisms to bring unity to Scotland and England, and they add Ireland as well, into a new form of religion that will reject the older abuses of the English church and bring about a new period of church harmony. So how were they going to do this? The assembly will sit from 1643 up to 1652, as I've mentioned before, but the main activities take place uh, between 1643 and 1649. The assembly was structured um, in a bit of a haphazard way at times. They did not have great policies. They did not have Robert's rules of order. So occasionally things got a little out of control. But their general organization was to set up three standing committees, committees that would meet always, to divvy up work that were... Um, basically just divided up on the initial roll call. Um, this led to an imbalance in the committees because when Parliament sent out the order for the members of the committee, uh, the best people were kind of mentioned first and then, you know, kind of got less and less as it went down. And so the first committee was, uh, as I said, chaired by Cornelius Burgess, and it was made up of the most number of theologians and doctors of divinity. These standing committees would then report back to a plenary session in which the entire assembly would vote on every matter. In addition to these standing committees, throughout the assembly, over 200 ad hoc committees were commissioned to do various things, from writing correspondence to foreign churches, to responding to parliament, to uh, drafting certain, certain documents or elements of documents. All of this went on. Committees would generally meet in the morning, and then uh, reports would be brought to a plenary session before the entire assembly later on. Uh, in total, there were three, uh, 1,333 plenary sessions throughout the assembly. 
the tasks were quite broad. Um, we shouldn't think that the assembly only spent its time writing documents. They were also there to advise parliament on various ecclesiastical matters, uh, how to discern the signs of the times. There were often days of worship, days of fasting, in order to bring their minds very close to advise on the war effort. They also, uh, because there were no bishops left, were the only official church body uh, operating in England at the time. So therefore, they were tasked with examining candidates for the ministry and fellows for the universities. Um, they, so they had a major role there. And the, the role they're most remembered for is their debate and drafting of documents to accomplish the goals of the Solemn League and Covenant, the reorganization of the church. Sometimes they would spend much of their time merely in debate, trying to figure out how to move forward on these issues. It's very difficult to get an exact timeline of the assembly's work because they would move from thing to thing in various months. But most broadly considered, their early period from the summer of 1643 to the summer of 1645 was spent debating church government and the nature of worship. This was probably the most contentious of the debates, as we mentioned before, with the various ecclesiastical parties and various opinions on worship. Out of this would become a new directory for this. In late 1645, Parliament would attempt to institute a Presbyterian form of government throughout England by having churches appoint sessions, elders, and um, ministers, and set up preliminary presbyteries. However, this is during the war. Things are not going uh, very well. There is no organizational structure to accomplish this, and it's quite half-hearted. It takes uh, almost no hold outside of London in its early years. We'll come back to that and a moment. So the early part of the assembly was debating church government and worship. As it moves to its main event from 1645 to 1647, we get the writing of the confession and the catechisms, probably the biggest contribution of the assembly to church history going forward. From 1649 until 1652, the assembly is quite weakened. Um, this is because of events in the English Civil War. The rise of independency in this period uh, really saps the strength of many of the assembly and many leave. So after 1649, uh, you have a very small number gathering, and they gather mu much less frequently, weekly rather than daily, and their main function is to examine candidates for the ministry. Eventually, it will be entirely closed in 1652. So these are the main kind of eras of the assembly. Church government and worship, the first phase, confession and catechism, the second phase, and kind of the wind-up phase of a what we call a rump assembly, only part of it, uh, examining candidates in the final years. But in their prime, they were extremely productive. From 1643 to 1647, the assembly wrote many documents that would be foundational for the establishment of a new church settlement across all the kingdoms. Its first main two were the directory for ordination. What does it take to be ordained and how is this to be done? Uh, this was not a major document, but it was one of the first they set forward because they were now the main ordaining body in all of England. And there wanted to be a unity between Scotland and the English church on what ordination entailed. Their next major piece was the directory for worship. This was to replace the Book of Common Prayer. Rather being a set form of liturgy that the Book of Common Prayer was, with set prayers, set readings for each day, which had caused much consternation over the past of English church history, the Directory of Public Worship is a set of principles and forms that need to be in worship but does not require them. And so it is, as some theologians and historians have called it, a build-your-own liturgy practice. There are prescribed things that must be done, but their manner is not prescribed. And this was quickly promulgated throughout England. The major doctrinal works that were attempting to bring clear and definitive unity between Scotland and England were first the Westminster Confession, first printed in 1646, although it would be sent back to the assembly for proof text and reprinted in 1647, and the shorter and larger catechisms, both printed in 1647. The document that was debated the longest from the very beginning of the assembly, 
um, and printed the last was the Directory for Church Government, printed in 1647 by the Scots and only after that by the Parliament. This form of government was never actually approved by both houses of Parliament. And uh, by the time it was ultimately out, it was kind of a moot point. But a large element of the Assembly's labors went into all of these documents. I now want to briefly explain the central two we'll be looking at in this class, the Westminster Confession of Faith, its structure, and the longer and shorter catechisms. The Westminster Confession of Faith is probably the most significant of the documents that come out of the assembly. In this, it is a trying to bring together the best of Protestant and Catholic theology from all of church history and put it in an accessible form for the people. By Catholic here, I do not mean Roman Catholic, but the best traditions of the church dating back to the apostolic period set forth clearly. Now, the structure of the catechism is following more or less the history of redemption. It begins with the doctrine of scripture or the prolegomena to our faith. How is it that we know God? Because he has revealed himself in his word. The Confession then goes on to discuss God and his decrees. The foundation of everything we believe comes from God and who he is and what he has decreed to do. From there, we look at the doctrines of creation, the fall in section 5, and then redemption. This redemption is grounded on the covenant and Christ. One of the main features of this document is its inclusion of covenant theology, which to this point had not been included in a Reformed confession. Uh, largely because of the development of covenant theology more so in the 17th century. From there, we get the order of salvation, the application of Christ's work to the individual. We'll look at that in more detail later on. And then at the end, the people of God. What does it mean for us to live together as God's people in a godly society? In the Shorter Catechism, it is said that um, the Bible tells us what we are to believe about God and what our duties are before him. In many ways, you can see the first part of the confession from section 1 to section 18 of what are we to believe about God and the people of God, what are, we, what are the duties we owe God moving forward. The confession then ends with the concept of consummation, with the final judgment, and the heavenly reward that one will receive. The confession is really attempting to bring together all of the Reformed creeds and confessions from here on and set forth the pinnacle of Reformed Orthodoxy, and it really does achieve that. So the goals of the Confession were, as I've said, to bring together the Scottish and English Presbyterian churches, but also, sorry, the Scottish and English Reformed churches, including Ireland, but also to be an emblem of renewal and unity with the broader churches on the continent as well. The Dutch Reformed Church, the French Reformed Church, the Swiss Reformed Church, etc., it was trying to declare itself a church fully reformed in both theology and in worship, and in many ways it succeeded. Additionally, it is trying to update the confessional tradition of the Reformed Church. Many confessions had been written before this, the French Confession, the Belgic Confession, the Scot Scotch Confession, etc., but the Westminster Confession is trying to do something else. It is trying to give the most advanced, most up-to-date view of Reformed pastoral, exegetical, and scholastic theology and set it forth in an understandable way. Now, you might see critiques sometimes, and uh, especially by Thomas Torrance and others, that the Westminster Confession of Faith is scholastic. This is not exactly the case. Scholastic theology is a mode of theological thinking or genre. It is the theology of the academies of the period, using uh, very precise language and careful distinctions. We'll notice that the confession does not use that many technical terms. It does occasionally, but those are generally very common technical terms. It is not scholastic in form, nor is its doctrine um, particularly scholastic. Scholasticism is not a doctrine. It is a method of doing theology that was reserved for the academy. And many of the best pastoral theologians of this period were simultaneously some of the best scholastic the theologians, etc. So what is trying to be brought together here is the flowering of Reformed Orthodox the best that the tradition has to offer so that people can be um, nurtured and grounded in the faith. In addition to setting forth the height of uh, Reformed Orthodoxy, the Confession is likewise trying to be a compromise document. It, as we've said before, Confession is not a dogmatics. It is not trying to settle every issue of theology. Rather, it is attempting to be a broad statement 
of reformed truth so that the various members of the assembly, some of whom disagreed on various points of theology, could come together. So the Westminster Confession is a bold statement of reformed orthodoxy that compromises on certain things to bring the broadest approach and broadest unity of those signing onto it. And it is a remarkable achievement. We'll be spending the rest of our time looking into it in more depth. The other major contribution of the assembly that needs to be noted is the longer and shorter catechism, or the larger and shorter. Um, it is stated differently in different places. After several fits and starts going on throughout the assembly, uh, including the rejection of two drafts, the assembly decides in January 1647 to produce two catechisms, a shorter catechism and a long, uh, longer catechism. The shorter catechism was generally for children, and the longer catechism for more mature believers. There was a long catechetical tradition in both Scotland and England, and there were catechisms of different sorts, for mature believers leading up to hundreds of pages to toddler-sized catechisms, much like we have today. And the assembly decided that they needed to not create one single catechism, but two so it could be used in a multiple discipline or uh, discipleship settings. They, the pastors were very keen to make sure their catechism was useful, that it was accurate, that it was well put together, that it could be used effectively. And in fact, many of the members of the assembly had experience with this, with at least 12 of them having written catechisms uh, on their own at various times in their lives. These, the larger catechism would be the foundational text here, and the shorter catechism is a redaction in some ways of the longer, and the longer catechism will structure itself around the Apostles' Creed in substance, but not really in form, so you don't see it looking at the articles of the Creed specifically, but their content are clearly seen, and then it moves into the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, and the Sacraments. This was a fairly traditional structure for a catechism at this time. However, the catechism does have a rather unique and advanced element, such that the questions are self-contained and don't presuppose knowledge of previous questions. Many other catechisms would kind of flow from question to question, asking clarifying points from the previous question. This was something helpful, but it requires a memorization in a chain without kind of memorizing things individually. So the shorter catechism is much more modular, and one can remember a given question without having to remember the question before it or after it. Now, what was the goal of this catechism? Remember, this was put forth by the Parliament, but the Assembly had its clear purposes behind it. One, they wanted to promote the knowledge of the faith. The confession was not enough. They also needed a training tool to disciple people in it. And so one of the purposes of the catechism was to have a catechism that went along with the confession, that reinforced each other. Uh, they were never intended to say anything different, but to mutually inform, so that from the late, from the youngest child up to a mature Christian, they could have uh, a clear understanding of the faith. And catechisms in many ways function as curricula for teaching and discipleship. Additionally, Catechisms go beyond a confession in that they move from doctrinal beliefs also to ethical teachings. And that's what we get especially in this section on the Ten Commandments, that they are seeking to train and instruct believers in the Christian life. That is much more the realm of the catechism that teaches ethical behavior, what do all the commands connect or, uh, require of us, and how do we live a godly and upright life? How can we engage in the ordinances of the church, in prayer, in fasting, in taking of the sacraments? And so catechisms are a connection to the confession, trying to instill it in us, while at the same time going beyond it to dig deeper into Christian living. Another element of a catechism is not only to speak truth, but also to ward off error. Just as we saw with the confession, the catechism is called to remove from us false teachings. So these are the main elements of the Assembly's productivity. They set forth a catechism that bound together um, the English and the Scottish and the Irish churches, and a catechism that would bind them together even more. However, um, as you might know, this did not work. Sadly, as this was taking place during the English Civil War, shifting political ties and alliances would ultimately bring the Solemn League and Covenant to naught. And this brings us to the aftermath of the assembly. 
as I mentioned, the English Civil War was complex and had various sides. The first English Civil War was the Parliamentary Forces and the Scottish Covenanters against the King. When this came to an end in May of 1646, with the capture or the surrender of Charles I, rather, to the Scottish Covenanters, who turned him over to Parliamentary Forces, this began to cause a bit of a rupture between the two. You see, the Scots really wanted a committed Presbyterianism in their structure, but recall their vow. They vowed for Presbyterianism and loyalty to the king. As the king had been defeated and handed over the parliamentary forces, a new player really was on the scene. This is called the New Model Army. This was the army raised by Parliament that was commanded by leading figures, one of whom was Oliver Cromwell. The army had become extremely successful with new disciplines and professionalization. However, it had also become a hotbed of independency or congregationalism. And so as the war was won and the New Model Army was the leading power in the state, independency was taking off as the foreseen future of England. For the Scots, this was a disaster. They wanted to have an official Presbyterianism in Scotland, and they saw an independency in England as just as threatening as an episcopacy. And so after Charles I is captured, the Scots begin to negotiate with him. Eventually, Charles I will escape captivity. He will join forces with the Covenanters against Parliament. So this brings us to the Second English Civil War, in which Parliament is fighting the Royalist forces led by Charles, allied with the Scottish Covenanters. They were um, contented with Charles' claims that he would allow Presbyterianism to take off under them, that he would support their claims as long as Parliament was defeated. The Scots had felt that the New Model Army and Parliament had not lived up to the Solemn League and Covenant, and therefore the Scottish commis commissioners left the assembly and ultimately returned to England. However, the New Model Army defeated the Scottish Covenanters and Charles I, who was uh, captured once again and ultimately executed in January of 1649 for treason against the nation. This caused a further break in the members of um, the assembly and of English society, with many Puritans uh, who held to a Presbyterian form of government finding this is going too far and seeing independency take over. At this point, many of the members of the assembly would leave, moving us into that final stage of a rump assembly. There would be one more civil war after the execution of Charles I, called the Third Civil War, and once again, Parliament versus the Royalist forces, now led by Charles II, Charles I's son, allied with the Scottish Covenanters, which would end once again with the defeat of the Royalist and the Scottish. So in this, the assembly is going on, trying to unify the religious, ex uh, religious expression, government, and polity of Scotland and England and Ireland. The war goes a different way. Scotland will ultimately change sides, and uh, rather than seeing the implementation of these documents, we will see the rise of independency. This is done under Oliver Cromwell, as I said, one of the leaders of the New Model Army. Eventually, uh, he would be elected to be the Lord Protector of England, and under his leadership, independency would come to be the law in England. He was himself a deeply committed Puritan and Congregationalist, and he therefore did not support the uh, official church structure of Episcopacy or Presbyterian forms of government. And under his reign, um, there was more or less religious toleration throughout England and no official church government. But these, this left the Westminsterian documents rather alone. Presbyterianism on its own was not really able to sustain itself in England. And at the time of what's called the Restoration, after the death of Cromwell, Charles II is invited back to England to take the throne, and he reestablishes a pre-Westminsterian religious settlement on England, going back to more or less a stricter version of the religious settlement under Elizabeth. Those who had been members of the assembly, and many of the Puritans were removed from the church, and they became what were known as nonconformists, leading into an entirely new era of struggle in the English church between establishment now Anglicanism and the Puritans.
So it is a rather sad end to the discussion. The assembly started out with such high hopes, but ultimately it was a failure. And that is kind of how it goes. The Westminster Assembly can be seen as an extremely successful failure. If you judge it by its original intent to reform the liturgy and worship and to clarify the theology of the Church of England, it does fail. Um, England will never again have a significant Presbyterian or even uh, adopt these documents in any significant way. The initial attempt to establish Presbyterianism in 1645 um, ultimately comes to naught, and it is quickly unraveled. The documents of Westminster are never uh, adopted officially in England for any amount of time, and by 1660 they are almost entirely forgotten. However, um, while the Westminsterian Assembly is very much an English event, it was done by English theologians for the English church, they were not trying to write an English confession of faith. They were trying to express quite clearly the teachings of of God's Word and Reformed Orthodox understandings. And from that, from their careful engagement with the text, years of study, years of debate, and years of honing, uh, the Westminster Confession was quickly understood to be a great achievement. And so even though the Scots ultimately turned against uh, the parliamentarians, they do adopt the Westminster Confession as the official document, uh, uh, the official standard of theology for the Scottish Church in 1647. Later on, this will be the defining tradition of American Presbyterianism as well, with the Adopting Act of 1729. But beyond that, not just would Presbyterians cling to this document as an excellent summary of Christian doctrine, it would form the basis of other confessional traditions as well. For instance, the London Baptist Confession of 1689 is a mildly updated version of the Westminster Confession, changing uh, the distinctions on baptism and church government, and the Congregationalist Church will likewise accept a modified form of the Westminster Confession in what's called the Savoy Declaration of 1658. Uh, one of the signers of that is John Owen, amongst others. So the Westminster Confession really stands at the top of 17th century Reformed and Protestant theology, bringing together the best minds of the day to express a theology that is trying to be faithful to Scripture and give the full element of God's Word to the world. The Confession, although it is bounded in time, it needs to be understood within this context of the English Civil War and the struggles for political and ecclesiastical control in England, it is not limited to that. This confession is trying to say this is what it means to confess God fully. This is what it means to follow God despite uh, very difficult circumstances. And although the men who sat in that assembly, many of whom uh, when they died would have thought of it as a time um, of failure in a worldly sense, they had not achieved their goals. These documents they worked on for years were forgotten. Some of them had to, many of them, in fact, had to leave their churches and were left fairly destitute. But God, in his mercy and wisdom, allowed this document to be a leading light of orthodoxy throughout the entire world. Not only do the Congregationalists and Baptists and Presbyterians hold to this in uh, the English-speaking world, but the Westminster Confession is established as an official confessional document on every continent in the world by Presbyterian and by those who have used modified versions. The Westminster Confession is one of the most successful of all Protestant confessions, and even though it ended in failure in its own country, it has been the guiding light of Protestant and Presbyterian orthodoxy since this time. As we dig into the actual teachings of the Westminster Confession in our later lectures, remember that these were men seeking to speak forth the truth of God despite the struggles of their own time and their own world. And God has honored that commitment in using this document to bring many to knowledge of himself.